The founder and CEO of Launchpeer joins us to share why he believes your startup idea is terrible until you validate it and actually sell something. He also explains how he went from being homeless to hitting business home runs. The common traits of successful startup founders, why coachability is the key to success as an entrepreneur, why it's important to track your company's numbers early on, and why focusing on the legal aspects of your business pre-product or pre-business or pre-sales really doesn't matter at all. Two men, 13 multi-million dollar businesses, eight kids, one business coach radio show. It's the Thrive Time Business Coach Radio Show. Get ready to enter the Thrive Time Show. That's it. Bombs away. We started from the bottom of you. We started from the bottom and we'll show you how to get you. Started from the bottom now we here. We started from the bottom now we All right, Thrive Nation, welcome back to another exciting edition of the Thrive Time show on your radio and podcast download. And on today's show, we're interviewing the founder and CEO of a company called Launch Peer. Launch Peer, which is a company designed to help founders out there to turn their ideas into reality. Mr. Jake, welcome onto the show. How are you, sir? Great. Thanks, guys. I really appreciate you having me on. Jake, your last name, some people are asking, is it Hair? Is it Harry? How do you pronounce that last name, Mr. Jake? You know, I always say hair like a rabbit uh, because that's the easiest way to say it. Some people, I always get people to spell my name H-A-I-R on coffee cups and stuff. Uh, It's H-A-R-E. That's the easiest way to remember it, like a rabbit. Okay, hair like a rabbit. I want to clear that up. I know some listeners are like, how do I say his name? I don't know how to do it. So, (laughs) So, Jake, with your company, Launch Peer, I want to spend some time talking about that. But before we get into that, I'd like to talk uh, about your background growing up. Uh, what was lo- life like for you growing up as a kid? Yeah, so I come from a really uh, low-income household. Um, my uh, mom and dad split up when I was really, really young. Um, so I was about four or five years old. Don't even remember when it happened. But you know, growing up, we were pretty low income. We were actually homeless for a while when I was uh, yeah, really early on in high school. I remember having to uh, – my dad had a warehouse. He was a truck driver. And we used to wash ourselves up in the sink of his uh, truck warehouse. So we, you know, after school, he took us up. We'd drive around the neighborhood until he knew everyone was out of work and no one was at the warehouse. And we'd pull the car in. Uh, it was like a little 1990-something Ford Contour that uh, me and my little sister and my dad would all sleep in. But he pulled the car in. Uh, we'd park it there. We'd wash ourselves up in the sink. Um, not, not a typical background that you hear from most entrepreneurs i'm sure we'll get into that later in the episode but um but yeah growing up i always thought to myself like i this can't be life after uh and and by life after i mean defined after high school after college like after i do something for myself i mean you can't really do anything about the circumstances you're in when you're a kid and even in in normal life i know you guys talk about this on the show sometimes there's some situations that you're in that you don't have control over but you do have control over your actions and how you put some of that stuff into context. Uh, and so growing up, I mean, people ask me sometimes like, well, is that hard for you? Like, you know, how do you think it impacted your life? And honestly, I think, you know, it wasn't the greatest childhood, but it did impact my life, I think, in a positive way because it definitely puts things into a lot clearer perspective today as I have, you know, I'm married and I have my own two kids. And uh, it's a lot easier to think through some of the successes and failures that you have as a business owner, putting in the context of, well, at least it's not that. Um, as you get older. Wes Carter, you are a very successful attorney now, and uh, we all grew up a certain way. Uh, yeah. We all have certain backgrounds. Um, how did your childhood impact your career, or, di- or did it impact your career? I think it did for sure. I think, um, you know, my dad is a disabled veteran. I don't know if you know this, Clay. So we grew up on a small fixed income. We were lucky to have that fixed income. We knew a check was carrying a month, but not a whole lot of money. And so... You know, I haven't, neither one of my parents had uh, bachelor's degrees in, in college. And so I was kind of the first one to go definitely for a doctorate, you know, getting my JD and then also with my, uh, you know, finishing all four years of college. And, it, you know, it's just kind of coming from those beginnings, I think kind of like Jake was alluding to, it puts a different perspective on things. It gives you something to aspire to, but you know, nothing's going to be handed to you, but you better go out and earn it. Jake, um, there's a lot of people out there that uh, have battled poverty, 
who bat- battled the things you battled. But I understand it again. If I'm getting anything out of context or I'm at all off, I never want to, uh, you know, paint someone to the corner with the wrong uh, conclusions here. But I, I believe you also dealt with drugs and alcohol. I mean, was that something you dealt with as well, or, or am, I, am I off? No, you're right. Um, but it wasn't me, actually. So that was uh, my family. So okay. the reason that we were homeless, my, my dad was actually an alcoholic. Um, and that's why he had a very hard time taking care of me and my sister uh, growing up. And so he was, you know, pretty consistently between jobs, um, had a hard time keeping things afloat. Um, the reason we were living with my dad and not my mom is because my mom was actually a drug addict. So we would pass back and forth custody hearings between, oh, well, who this week is the best person to take care of the kids? Uh, it, you know, it was like a back and forth battle. And so I saw the kind of things that they were dealing with growing up. And so I, even though I never really had to battle uh, drug addiction or alcoholism, it still has a really big impact on my life and uh, growing up. And basically the way I raised my kids has a lot to do with what I saw happening back then when I was a kid. So what happens is you – Myself, Wes, anybody out there who grew up without a bunch of things, you decide, you know what, that was that reality, and I can either become bitter or better. You decided to become better. I think Wes decided to become better. I think I decided to become better. doesn't mean we're perfect, but we've built a life for ourselves that's very different from maybe the life we grew up in or the life we experienced or whatever. And you've written about this before, Jake, and I, you put a really good name on it. It's called Battling the Imposter Syndrome. For entrepreneurs, I remember the first time I was invited to a very nice uh, Christmas party. Uh, Wes, do you ever get invited to Christmas parties? I do, yeah. And I got invited to one where they served wassail. Uh, Jake, are you familiar with what wassail is? <laughs> no, I'm not actually. <laughs> wassail is a hot apple cider uh, that you would call it hot apple cider unless you were grew up, you know, without a lot of money. You call you call it wassail. It's a, it's a premium. Okay. Uh, Doctor Zellner, I'm sure you've you've probably had uh, wassail during your lifetime. Well, of course, who hasn't? So I went. I got invited to a Christmas party as a young guy because I was having a lot of success in business. Is that the wassailing will go? Almost? And well, this is the thing. This person invites me to their house. It is over there by Holland Hall in Tulsa, Oklahoma. Holland Hall, by the way, Jake is a very very nice prestigious school. I get invited uh, to, okay. this, to this uh, Christmas event. They're serving wassail. And see, what other kind of accoutrements? I mean, Wes, what, they have the, they're have passing entrees and hors d'oeuvres. What other kind of stuff do you serve, yeah. Wes, at a high-dollar Christmas party? Uh, a carcuterie car- board? I can't even say it. A cheese tray? Yeah, a cheese tray. What else? Um, what else are high-end accoutrements they're going to serve at a nice Christmas party? Uh, some caviar. What else? Mm. There's more. Some quiche. Quiche, yes. Yeah. So they're serving wassail and quiche and these things. Everyone's you got guys are m- missing the most important high-end Ooh. accoutrement for a Christmas party. What is that? Fruitcake. Nice. <laughs> oh, all so right. This is yeah, what, this yeah, what yeah, happens. I'm not kidding. I'm, I'm the only person, because I was Entrepreneur of the Year when I was 27 for the Small Business Administration. I get invited. I'm the only person there who's not over 40 years old. Mm. I'm like 26. I'm at this gated community. You know this, Jake? I had never gone into a gated community ever previous to this Christmas party. I go oh, in there, nice. and the guy says to me, and he, I'm sure he said it in a normal tone, but he says, this is, what, this is how I heard him say it. So uh, do, do you want some wassail? I don't know what it is. I mean, like, uh, yeah, I think I'll have some wassail, but I didn't know what it was. I mean, is this bad? Is this? Is, are we? Are, what are we going to do here? I get the wassail, <laughs> and I didn't know it was hot, so I take a, a quick gulp of it because I'm used to gulping apple juice, yeah, right? You gulp yeah. it. I go for the gulp. You don't gulp. You sip. Wes, you know this. You sip, right? I know this now. But yes. I gulp, burn my lip, and I drop the cup because it's so hot. The cup is like this Party china. Foul. That's like this handmade, whatever it is. Oh, no, no. And the owner of the home looks at me Ooh. like, what? And there's some fancy <laughs> brand. It was like probably a few hundred dollars. So I'm not kidding. This same man asks me out to lunch a few years later, and we go out to a Thai restaurant where apparently you're not supposed to eat the bamboo shoots in the soup. Oh. I did not know this. So I just devoured the bamboo shoots, ate them, swallowed them. It hurt coming out. The point is, I had never grown up with that kind of wealth. I wasn't sure what to do. I didn't know these things. Can you talk, to, Jake, to listeners out there who are coming into money? They're starting to have some success. What does it mean when you say to battle the imposter syndrome? Yeah, so, I mean, imposter syndrome, basically, uh, when you're talking about entrepreneurship, is we see a lot of the uh, – bright lights around entrepreneurship today, right? Like you see people on the cover of Forbes and TechCrunch and these startups doing big, great things. Well, one of the things you ne- you don't really see very often uh, is the the bad times, 
like the times that you couldn't pay your rent or the times that you missed uh, your mortgage payment. Or for us, th- during the first couple of years of launch peer, I, I, my credit score dropped uh, precipitously. <laughs> during that time. Uh, you know, we, we had our electricity shut off at least three times. Uh, missed mortgage payments. Like, you know, it Oof. was tough, but you don't go to parties like the one that you were describing and tell, tell people when they ask you, like, hey, how are things going? You're not going to say, yeah, man, this, you know, a couple of days ago, I missed my mortgage payment. And I don't know if I'm going to be able to make payroll next week, but you know, everything's, <laughs> uh, everything's okay. Like, you don't, you right. don't go say stuff like that. Right. So what happens is it creates this fog around entrepreneurship where everyone thinks everyone's doing better than they are. And mm-hmm. so it makes you feel if things aren't going well, that, well, there's, there must be something wrong with me. Like I'm the problem and I'm an imposter. I, I'm not the right person to be building this startup or I'm not the right person to be building this business. And that's just, totally not true because you're glossing over the surface of what everyone else is actually going through. Everyone at that party was probably dealing with stuff. Your worst problem that night was spilling uh, cider on, your, on yourself. Uh, but for everyone else, like I'm sure there are people in there pretending that their business was going great. Uh, and two months later, their business shuts down, but nobody talks about that stuff. Charlie, uh, Jake, I'm not sure if you're familiar with a guy by the name of Charlie Rocket. Are you familiar with Charlie Rocket? Uh, name sounds familiar. Are you familiar uh, with uh, Two Chains, the rapper Two Chains? Oh yeah, yeah. Okay, Charlie Rocket was the uh, Grammy award-winning manager of Two Chains, and just through ah, a series okay. of of events and things, he's going to be he's become a friend of mine, and he's speaking at our conference in December. And uh, Charlie Rocket was talking about how uh, Two Chains got signed by Ludacris to a lifetime deal. And he had been signed to Ludacris's rap label for over a decade and had never really taken off. But he still had to, when he rapped, show up at concerts wearing like diamonds and leased, you know, diamonds and leased. Because as a rapper, you have to look successful. You can't roll up like in a, you, know, you can't, typically you can't roll up in like a beat up Buick and then be talking about bling yeah. bling. And I think a lot of entrepreneurs are playing that game, too. So what advice would you have for somebody out there who is battling the imposter syndrome? Well, so there's a couple pieces of advice that people normally give in this situation. One is, oh, well, you know, just be more open about how everything is going. And that is totally the wrong advice. But the last thing I want to tell an entrepreneur is to go to a networking event and they meet an investor who could potentially give them, you know, a lifeline to scale their company and tell them, like, yeah, things are going terribly right now and we're about to not make payroll. Like you don't want to do that. So that's not the best advice. The best advice to do is just, it has to be internal. Like you have to just understand yourself that when you're looking at these people, it's like that, that advice when people are doing public speaking and they tell people, well, look around the room and just imagine everybody naked. Well, when you're an entrepreneur, what you have to do is when you go to these events and you start feeling that imposter syndrome, just look around the room and realize that these people are probably dealing with challenges that you just can't see on the surface. Uh, and although you're not going to talk about it at dinner parties or you're not going to talk about it at networking events, you just have to internally know that whatever you're doing, as long as you're doing something, you're doing better than other people. But taking action as an entrepreneur, as long as you're doing something, I mean, we've probably all known people like this who complain about their jobs, complain about their life, uh, complain about how things are going, but they're just not doing anything about it. Um, as long as you're taking action and doing something, you're, you're probably doing better than 99% of other, other people. Clay, I had a quick question for you. Uh, yes. This public speaking thing is kind of hit just a nerve, a little, little quick rabbit trail, can we? May I? Yes. Uh, that time that you were having to speak at the nudist colony, you couldn't really imagine them naked. So how did, did you have to do a reverse imagine? Did you have to Jake, reverse them dressed? Can I, Jake, can I tee up this, this story real quick did just you have so to, that you have some context here? Uh, Wes, have you heard this story? I have not, but I'm really interested in it. We had, <laughs> we had in Bristow, Oklahoma, there is a camp out there that hired my company, djconnection.com, to entertain for their people. They're having a picnic. Okay. So one of our sales reps answers, answers the phone. Boop, 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 boop. DJ Connection, how can I help you? They said, hey, I'm looking to hire a DJ to perform at our picnic. And they, d- then the, the salesperson says, okay, what date? This date. How many people? Okay. What time? Great. Well, let me check availability. Comes back. Okay, we have three different packages. Which one do you want? Great. Package B. Great. We're awesome. Um, you want to do debit card, credit card, deposit? Book the date. Now, on the notes, the, the notes, Jake, um, imagine you're a disc jockey. It's, this is your first show. And they, yeah, a man by the name of David sure. loads up, loads up. He's been training for two weeks. I give him the itinerary. <laughs> and I said, David, this is your first show. 
I want you to go out there <laughs> and, and dominate. Just dominate. Now, real quick, this guy, uh, had, David, had pretended he weighed about 450 pounds, 400 pounds, and he pretended to be, he told me, in, in their final interaction while training, he goes, Clay, speaking in front of large groups isn't a problem for me because I'm part of a boy band. We're huge in Orlando right now. We have a record deal. We're massive. We're going to be taken off. And I go, okay. So he made up that story, I guess, as a way to impress me to get his first show. And I knew his cousin. He was like, he always talks about that, but he's never been in a boy's band, boy band, nor can he carry a tune. <laughs> so anyway, I did not assign him to this gig based upon this information, but I did book him because he did a good job in training. So I hand him the show notes, and on the show notes, it says the date, the venue, the time, whatever, the address. And on it, it says, yada, yada, adult picnic. And I'm thinking, you know, oh, nothing big. No. He drives <laughs> out there to Bristow, Oklahoma, to this rural community, and he gets there to set up the DJ equipment like a normal gig, except everyone is naked. The guy who walks up to the car and tells him where to park is <laughs> naked. He's like, that's weird, maybe. Everyone's naked. So he comes back from the show at like 2 in the morning looking like his soul had been taken from him, like he's a victim of a, of a crime of some kind. And I go, David, what happened? He's all wet. He goes, dude, you freaking sent me out to a nudist colony. You, Dude, that's not cool, okay? I did make up the thing about the boy band, but I'm not, that's not cool, man. And I'm like, I, I have no idea. I'm like, what do you mean? He goes, dude, everyone was naked. And I'm like, well, what did you do? He goes, well, I couldn't be the only one with clothes on. It was embarrassing. Oh, no, 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 true no. story. Oh. So he got, oh, I know. he got naked and was in the hot tub. That's why he came back wet. Oh. True story. True story. Craziest story ever. Nice. So anyway, I don't know if there's a point we can get out of that, but the point is, Z. Point, the, the point is, public speaking is a tricky thing, so that's the point. <laughs> okay, that's the point. <laughs> yeah. Okay, so, so Jake, I've seen where you've written that your idea, your startup idea, your startup idea sucks until you validate it. Sounds kind of harsh. What do you mean? It is kind of harsh, but it is definitely what most entrepreneurs need to hear. So we meet a lot of entrepreneurs at LaunchGround. We, we, we've worked with hundreds of entrepreneurs around the world. And there's one thing I could tell you 100% is that an idea is a dime a dozen. Like mm. we hear ideas all the time. I'm sure you guys hear, hear crazy ideas all the time too. Um, and some of the crazy ideas could actually be worth something if the founder did what they needed to do to make sure that it was going to be a legitimate business. And you guys also preach this on, on a lot of the episodes too about how you need to make sure that you have uh, an actual customer that you can actually make a sale, that you know what your ROI is going to be, all of that stuff. Well, a lot of founders, they just have an idea and don't do anything with it. They, they take the time and energy and all of these things to build it because that's what's comfortable to them. For most entrepreneurs, we, we're builders, and so we want to go build. The last thing we want to do is go talk to people and see if the idea is actually worth building. And so when I talk about how you know your idea sucks until you go validate it, it's because I don't want entrepreneurs to waste their time and energy on a terrible idea that nobody wants when they could easily go change the idea or come up with a new one that actually <laughs> has a valid business behind it. There are so many terrible ideas I've seen over the years, but Jake, I'm going to share the first one with you. It's been far enough in the past that no one will be able to guess who I'm talking about, okay? <laughs> This guy Good. comes in. This is the pitch. And I'll get to give it a Bostonian accent to give it some flavor. So here we go. See, this guy comes into the office. True story. This is at 1609 South Boston. i had been in that building for about a year. 1609 South Boston. He comes in. He goes, I was doing it here. And the lady says, yeah, this is my front desk lady. She goes, yeah, well, let me go get him. Because, you know, it's a time where I had a gap in my schedule. So this guy goes, so here's the deal. Have you ever been out to dinner? And I'm like, yeah. So you have to dinner. Does the table ever wobble? And I go, yeah, the table's wobble. So what I do is I put this, I put this uh, underneath it, and it's called the uh, table wedge. And what it does is it prevents all tables from wobbling. I'm thinking, okay. I feel like anybody could cut a piece of wood, or any restaurant owner's probably done that. You take a piece of wood. You know, this is a move, right? You just <laughs> shove in something, yeah. right? Because of foundation, or, or a napkin, shift, yeah, a napkin, whatever. I, I've worked yeah. at yeah. restaurants. Sure, package. I, mean, I worked at Applebee's. What Go you search. do is you just throw in anything you can find outside, right? A stick. Yeah. And he's like, it's the future. Because every how many tables are there in America? And I'm like, uh, I don't know. He's like, well, you think about it. There's at least 350 million tables, according to the whatever. Now, if every one of them just wobbled a little bit, right? 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 And he's like, I mean, I'm going, no. And I make a dollar per wedge. But what's really sad it. is he had spent, like, an insane amount of money buying a building uh. first. True story. Bought a building. It was creating these. They're just, like, pieces of wood. Like, wedges. And he had just tons of them. And I'm like, 
what kind of sales are we doing here? And there's this like, not a lot of sales. And I felt horrible because I wish somebody would have pulled him aside early on and said, dude, this side, so talk to me if I'm out there and I'm the guy who's making the, the table wedgies, right? And, uh, and I'm thinking about marketing this idea. And I'm thinking about buying a building, thinking about buying a production facility. How should I test my idea without spending $4 million first? That, that's a great example. So what that guy should have done is make one wedge, just one, just one, <laughs> yeah. not a whole warehouse full, one wedge. Uh, walk to as many restaurants as you can and try to sell that one wedge. Kind of like that, that sales uh, technique where it's like, oh, try, try to sell me this pen. Just walk around, try to find a restaurant owner who's willing to buy that one wedge for you. It could just be a dollar. It doesn't have to be hardly anything. It doesn't matter how much money it is, but you have to get someone to commit. Like, and the, the best way to get someone to commit, especially in a situation like that, is with their wallet. If you're not getting someone to commit with their wallet, then they're not really committing. Because this is another thing that happens with startup ideas is we go and talk to our great uncle Joe and great uncle Joe, when you pitch him the idea and he's sitting in his rocking chair and he's drinking probably the sixth beer he's had uh, <laughs> and you, tell, you pitch him your idea, he's like, yeah, you know what? That sounds like a really good idea. You should go build that thing. And then, you know, you spend a year building it and then you go back to great uncle Joe and you say, hey, the product's done. You know, like here, uh, it's, it's going to be $10 or $15 or whatever. And he's like, yeah, no, nah, I'm good. You know, no thanks. Uh, and that happens all the time. Uh, so when you're going out there and you're trying to do something, you need to pound the pavement first. Um, you know, make one wedge, go sell one wedge, and then come back to me after that. Abbreviated story, but uh, back in the day, I started a company called Epic <laughs> Photography. And I didn't have the ability to take photos, nor did I know someone who could take photos. But we went to the bridal show, made a tremendous booth, and we attempted to sell photography. And the brides would come into our booth and say, so what do you guys do? And I would say, well, let me ask you this. We have really great prices, but if every photographer charged the same price, what are you looking for? And the bride says, well, we want unlimited time. Another unlimited. bride says, I'd like to have a two-week turnaround time. Another bride says, well, I would like a money-back guarantee. Another bride says, I'd like to have like engagements first to try you out before I decide to commit, et cetera, et cetera. Long story short, Jake, I had one lady. She's like, I want to move forward. You guys sound like the best. And I said, here's the deal. We're all booked out. But if, I have, if, if we have an availability, you want me to call you and take a deposit? He goes, yes, let me give you my credit card. And I'm like, that's how I knew. So then we created Epic Photography to be all of the things that people wanted, Z. Another super move that I just think is a great story. Super. We, we've done a couple of podcasts and shows on this concept. Yes. And it was Tim Ferriss with the four-hour work week. Oh, this is true. What he did is he put, he, he acted like he had all these different books written. You right. know, there were, I don't know, 20, 30, 40, how many were there? A lot of different titles, and he worked with Mike Maples Jr. on this. Right, and so he puts these titles up as, you know, for sale, these books for sale, and then he just sat back and waited. And guess what he waited for? Which book got the most orders? And then he, it was happened to be the four-hour yeah, work did, week, and did, then he went and wrote the book. He did it with Google AdWords, and then he, I, you probably know this story, Jake, but he actually made false book covers and then wrapped actual books in bookstores with the book to see which yeah. one people would pick up. He had all the dirty moves. He had all the dirty moves, but the thing is, yeah. he, did, he found out what they wanted, and that's what you're saying, Jake. you got to find out that they want it, and he was like, you know, I'm not even sure what title they want. I mean, I know, you know, I know what I'm thinking here, but so he just threw all of them up there, and you threw them all against the wall, and the one that stuck was Four Hour Work Week. So he went and wrote a book. Based upon hour, what people want. Right. Jake, I have a Beautiful question thing. for you. If you could go back and educate a younger version of yourself, what advice would you give yourself? What's, what's a single piece of advice you'd look back and go, younger self, this is what you need to be doing? Yeah. So the one big piece of advice I give myself is I have permission to live my own life. So this, and I'll give you some context here. So when you're growing up and you're a poor kid, um, there's a couple ways that you define success. Uh, for me, that was three ways. One was being a celebrity, uh, for me, that was like an athlete. So uh, I played sports growing up as a kid. And so when you're on TV, when you look at TV and you watch TV and you try to find your role models there, uh, you find that. So athletes, you find doctors. So I used to watch ER all the time, uh, when it was still on, uh, it's kind of a weird show to watch as a teenager. Uh, <laughs> and, uh, the last thing was, was a lawyer. And so all growing up, all I had in, in mind of what success was, was being one of those three things. And I clung to that as a definition of success all through high school, all through college. I even graduated college and got accepted to law school, but couldn't pay for it. So I joined the army after law school 
uh, served for four years because I wanted the army to help pay for law school. And, and I clung to that belief without realizing that there were so many other things I could have done to be successful. Unfortunately, I have tons of student loans uh, still, <laughs> like I'm sure most people listening to the show probably do. Um, and if I can go back, I would have given my, myself permission to take control of my life earlier on. And for me, that would have been been becoming an entrepreneur. I, I didn't need a college degree to be an entrepreneur. I didn't need to join the army to be an entrepreneur and start my own business. I needed to make one wedge and go sell that one wedge <laughs> somewhere. Uh, <laughs> but I was just afraid to do that because I, I didn't think that was what you were like, quote, supposed to do uh, when I was younger. Jake, um, do you, uh, you know, like a movie, you'll watch a movie or you'll hear a song and all of a sudden it takes you back to a memory you had, you know, a certain line or a certain all the scene. time. Uh, when you were talking about lawyers being your heroes, it reminded me that that Wes really is the embodiment of all things that that Z and I would be if we had any talent or skill. Huh. Am I correct, Z? <laughs> Absolutely. Is this a time that we could sing our Bette Midler version of "Did You Ever Know You're My Hero" to Wes Carter with the wood block, with the with the cowbell? Are you okay? Here we go. Did you ever know that you're oh, my, my hero? hero? Wes is everything I wish I could be. Oh, Wes, let me just stop I can fly right higher yeah. than an eagle. Well, you make me a guy, Ro. I will tell you, Jake, though, when I graduated <laughs> law school, after many of my peers had spent $100,000 in tuition to get that little piece of paper, mm. I can think of numerous people I graduated with that within six months to 18 months decided they hated being a lawyer and never practiced law again. <laughs> Um, why, why are you a yeah, lawyer? I've heard, I've heard the same thing from several of my friends too. <laughs> um, I am a lawyer. Similar, I think a good lawyer it worked out for me. But with Jake, as a as a child, one of my dad's best friends was a, an attorney in Muskogee. He was a city attorney, um, and so I got to kind of see the law get exposed to it through him. But similar to what Jake was saying, I mean, you, when you're a kid, you don't know any better. Um, you're thinking, I want to be successful, and I had to. It made me think of you know, I, I could it resonated. Doctor, lawyer, mm. doctor, doctor. I, doctor. I don't really doctor. like blood, so that one went out pretty quick. Do you know? Hazard, it's, doctor. It's someone else's blood. I'm not messing with that. So, Do you um, <laughs> came to lawyer, and just I was one of those lucky few that happened to really find a love for the law and really enjoy doing it, and and so it worked out for me. Uh, Wes, did you like Perry Mason as a kid? Did you like the Perry Mason uh, I was not TV a show? Huge Perry Mason fan. Though. Why? I mean, just the fact that it was before your time. But why do you not like it? Well, I mean, I, I just never got into it, I, you know. Did you ever watch the movie Catch Me If You Can? Oh, yeah. <laughs> Did you? Yeah. Do you think there's a coincidence that he went from a doctor to a lawyer? Yeah, I think Is there's... that... Did you, did you just get the little metal thing and do it a, you know, a diploma? I mean, did you really... Every time you come I into mean, a room, I mean, we, I'm a very good faker. How do, that's what I'm very saying. Good. How do we... Yeah. How do we really, really know? Mm, that's true. That's true. That's true. Okay. So, you watch Perry Mason, you get you get the words, you know. <laughs> Jake Hare, next question for you, sir. Uh, the first four hours of your typical day now. Now that you're having some success, you're having some wins, what do the first four hours of your typical day look like? Yeah, so the way I start my day is with my kids and my wife. Um, so I have two kids. Uh, they're eight and six now. I have to remember. It feels like they're growing up really fast. Uh, but I have two kids. They're eight and six, both boys, uh, and then my wife. So really the first part of my day, as, as soon as I wake up, is I'm completely 100% focused on them. So I, I'm the one who gets the kids ready for school. Really? You know, I, I make sure all their weird documents are signed in their backpacks that I, I hate doing, make sure their homework's done, um, you know, make them breakfast, getting ready for school. I walk them to the bus stop. Um, and, you know, once I walk back, I, you know, get, you know, greet my wife, uh, you know, help her out of the house. You're a one-upper. You're a one-upper. Continue. She, she forget, you're a one-upper. You forget your keys. <laughs> She are you, are keys you like every a, day? So I'm usually digging for keys for every minute minutes uh, every morning. Jake, are you like a gourmet uh, cook? Are you like a, a here's a breakfast bar and uh, get out of, get out of here? Are you like oh, a, you to make eggs and bacon? I'm definitely bacon. a breakfast bar okay. kind of guy. Right. Pop, pop tarts. I feel a little better now. I feel uh, a little okay, better continue. now. I got to admit, continue. A little so better. We're feeling yeah. better. I feel a little better. Making breakfast for my kids is definitely uh, you know like pouring the milk into the cereal and okay. scooting oh, it over nice. across the, the, the bar. Um, All right. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you for um, – oh, man. But once, once that's done, uh, I spend – and this is probably the most important part – is I don't go into work. I only live 10 minutes away from the office, but I don't go into the office uh, until I have my entire day planned out. 
Um, and I'm not saying I have to plan like every minute. I'm not, I'm not the kind of guy that's like, Oh, I have to book my whole calendar out. I need to make sure I know exactly what I'm doing every single day. You know, I, I'm not like that, but one of the books I read that really helped me with this is called the one thing by Gary Keller. Um, yes. and in that book, like it, it really helped me realize, okay, every day when I start my day, I need to know what the one thing that's most important for me to accomplish that day is. Cause as a founder, and as a business owner or someone working in a business, it's very easy to lose sight of everything that you need to be uh, the, the most important thing that you need to be doing, because as soon as you get into work, you're going to be inundated with emails and calls and employees walking into your office and all of these things that aren't really all that important in the whole scheme of things. Uh, so what I do is I make sure that I know exactly what my one thing is before I go into work in the morning. And then I go into work because if I don't do that and I'm, I've tried this before, just like as an experiment, if I don't do that before I go into work, then my entire day will be lost. And I'll be looking back on the day at five o'clock and be like, where the heck did the day go? Like, what did I even accomplish today? Like, did I even get anything done? Did I make any forward progress on anything I was trying to do? And typically the answer is no, if I don't do that to start my day. Uh, here's a deep thought here for the listeners out there. Uh, we've had this book, The One Thing, recommended by so many people. And uh, so at one point I decided, you know what, I'm going to read this book. I'm in, uh, see, we've interviewed so many people who say, you know, this the is the book thing. I should read, the one book you should read. So I read the book. Then we reached out to Jay Poffison, the uh, co-author of the book. He sits down with Gary Keller to write each and every book that Gary does. And we had him on the show. Yeah, so if you're out awesome. there and you have yet to hear that podcast, go up there and look for it. It's an un unbelievable interview. Jay Poffison's a, a great American. I want to ask you, though, now, I want, I want to ask you this question here, Jake. Tell us about your company, Launch Peer, and what you guys do. Do you launch peers? I mean, are you a, are you a foundation restoration you a, company? What you do you guys captain? do? What are you? Yeah, so at Launch Peer, we are a design, development, and marketing studio for startups. So the only type of customer that we work with, and this is part of the focus thing that he teaches in the book, uh, the only startups that we work with are pre-Series A startups. Typically, these startups literally walk into our door with just an idea. Um, and we've had, we take pictures of every napkin sketch we get, and we get a lot of napkin sketches. What they'll do is they'll schedule a meeting with us, they'll slide a napkin sketch across the table, they'll say, hey, this is what I want you to build, or this is what I want to build, can you help me do it? And so we are working with these startups from the time that they come up with the idea, uh, helping them validate it helping them do branding and design, helping them go sell that first wedge like we talked about earlier, uh, and then helping them actually build their, their product. So we typically focus on tech startups, so anyone who wants to build a web or mobile application, um, and help them go out and get traction once our development team builds their product. And so far we've worked with, I think we're up to almost 400 startups now that we've worked with around the world. Um, so although we're located in Charleston, South Carolina, which is a beautiful city, um, we work with startups all over the place. And I tell people all the time I have the best job in the world. I get to work with a ton of different startups, a ton of different ideas. But unlike the founders that we work with, I actually get paid to do it. So it's an awesome job, and I wouldn't trade it for anything. Jake, would you consider a table wedgie to be a piece of technology? <laughs> I would not consider it to be a piece of technology. <laughs> I was curious if someone's revived if could, that if idea. You could, if you could replace... If you could replace a piece of technology with a, a napkin or a coaster, then I don't think it's a piece of technology. Okay, I just, I just that was the question I wanted to ask here. Now we're going to go around the table with the final <laughs> questions for Jay Care, Marshall Morris. I'm going to go with you. You're the uh, you're co author of the Amazon best selling book, Start Here. You're a fine business coach. You're on the show quite a bit. What tough questions do you have for Mr. Jake Hare? Uh, Jake, I got a I got a great question for you. Oh, you, you, you. You you talk about working in the world of a lot of napkin sketches, and so really you you just have to be able to have an idea to slide a napkin sketch across the table. I want to ask you, is there a particular quality or characteristic in the people that are sliding the napkin sketches across the table that you've seen consistently be able to take the idea to the, the full length, to be able to take it the distance to become successful? That's is a there, good question. Is there a consistent quality or characteristic you know, that you see immediately out of the people that are sliding these across the table to you? We should get some cowbell Definitely. on that. I mean, that's, that was cowbell. This is a hot question, question, Jake. This is a that's hot, a hot question. question. Hot question. Cowbell. Okay, back to you. Sorry. There we go. No, it's, it, it's a really great question. And I think this really falls in line with a lot of what you guys do. Uh, and you wouldn't think about this because when most people think of launch career, they think of us as like an agency, right? But we're, we're more than an agency. I say we're like a hybrid between an agency and like a startup accelerator. But there is one common trait, and we can always tell within the first five minutes of the first call with someone wow. is whether or not they're coachable. 
Ooh. If they're not coachable, uh, it means that their chances of success, whether they have an amazing idea or not, is it's just not going to happen for them. Um, for, for the most part, the entrepreneurs that we work with, they have to be incredibly coachable because we're not here to just build an app or you know, blow smoke up there, you know, uh, telling you- them how great their idea is. A, a lot of the entrepreneurs that we work with, we have to end up telling them, look, y- your idea, the way it sits right now is not great, but there are some things we can do to make it better. If they aren't able to take that advice, then there is no way that they can work with us. And, and further, after they're done working with us, there's no way they can build a successful business if they aren't coachable. Working with people like you guys, working with other business coaches and mentors, if you're not able to take their advice and actually implement that advice and, you know, take some constructive, constructive feedback in a good way, there's no way that you're going to build a successful business or successful startup. So, yeah, I say that's the one trait that's common among all the successful founders that we've worked with. Z, legally, uh, Wes Carter cannot claim to be the number one attorney in the world. He, he, well, or in the history of the galaxy, right? right he can't right. legally, Wes, you can't do that, right? Not in the entire Or other universe. planets. And I'm not going to go as far as to say, some, some have suggested that I should say Wes is the number one attorney in the world. Some have suggested. Some of my, I'd see, like to meet these people. See, some of our closest, Some, see, some of our closest <laughs> colleagues have told us, you know, huge people behind the scenes have said, right. you should mention that Wes is the best in the world. But we've said we can't do that. We, can, well, we just say uh, you know, he's just someone that we can strongly endorse. So his question, correct. what your question is, will be better than your question because he just asks a better question. He's a, he's a great attorney, Wes. But, but, Wes yeah. is the best. So, <laughs> see, you can ask whatever question you want. You can one-up Marsh. That's easy. Oh, but that's... to one up Wes is not possible. Yeah, so you go next. I mean, he's tall. He's I mean, he's tall. Very tall. Wes he's is very gonna, tall. Wes is going to bat fourth. I went first. Marshall second. You third. Wes is batting cleanup. Well, that's that's home fitting. Run. That's, that's go, fitting. You know. Go ahead and ask whatever question you want to be second best. We'll have a two-part question. Jay. Oh wow! <laughs> yeah. Oh. Ooh, all right. Here we so, go. So, in starting and forming your business yep. and growing it to what it is today, yes. Tell me the biggest mistake you made, Oof. and the biggest home run you made in doing that. All right. Perfect. So biggest mistake. Great question, by the way. Um, I don't even get cowbell. Enough. I didn't, I didn't even get cowbell. Exceptional. <laughs> Just okay. A little bit of cowbell. I didn't cowbell. get cowbell. Right. A little bit of cowbell. Okay, yeah. thank you. It's not very aggressive. Courtesy with bell. bell. Courtesy bell. Okay, go Big, ahead. Biggest mistake I made um, was not getting a grasp on the company's numbers faster. Mm. So early on, the first couple of years at Launchpeer, uh, we weren't tracking – uh, and this is totally, completely my fault. We, I wasn't tracking page views versus conversions. I wasn't measuring what marketing tactics were working best for us. I wasn't um, sticking to anything long enough to be able to track any numbers in the first place. I was kind of lost in just taking action. And, and there are, I said earlier, like taking action is something that you want to do. And it, puts you, it does put you ahead of 99% of people. But to get past that, you need to actually measure the action that you're taking. And so one of the things I wish I had done earlier on is actually measured the different things that we were doing, especially when it comes to sales and marketing. I mean, the first two years of the company were terrible. I, I talk about this all the time uh, publicly that, you know, the reason that we missed mortgage payments and the reason we had our electricity shut off uh, three times is because I wasn't doing the things I needed to do to measure what was actually working in the business and what wasn't working. Mm, um, now this leads to the, the biggest success piece, which is once I started doing that, I realized that I needed to change a lot of things about the company. And one of those was focus. Um, when I, when I started launch peer for the first two years, what I was doing was I was listening to a lot of what other people were telling me. So I, I had a lot of friends who were agency owners and they were telling me, well, you can't work with startups. Startups have no money. Like you're going to have to go after healthcare companies or big enterprise companies or, you know, small businesses, or you're going to have to offer more service in the development. You should do marketing and you should do Facebook ads, Google ads, and you should do websites and Shopify, all these things, uh, because that's how they were making money. But the problem was if you do, and if you do everything for anyone, then it doesn't separate you in the market at all. And, And so what I was, what was happening is when a customer would come to us at that point, they would ask me, well, what makes you different than, you know, this company over here? And I, I didn't have an answer. Like, oh, we're just better. Like, that's not a good answer uh, when you're talking to a prospect. So, well, the biggest success that we had was two years ago, we focused on who our ideal customer was, an entrepreneur with an idea and limited budget and decided, okay, what kind of services can we offer that person 
And we did a lot of crazy things at that time because of who our customer was. We put our pricing on our website. We packaged up our services. So we said, hey, we're going to do this, this, and this, and it's going to cost $5,000 to do it. You either take it or leave it. Like, we're not going to do whatever you want us to do because we know what we're doing. And if you want to work with us, then you're going to follow our system and our processes. And that was about middle of 2016. Between the middle of 2016 and the end of 2016, we went from me and my wife and a, a couple other contractors working in the company uh, to 12 employees and growing. Um, and so that would probably be the biggest success is really focusing on who my customer was and creating a product and service to actually fit the needs of that customer. Uh, Z, I want to let you know, you did get one mega point for that question. Uh, typically, even the, <laughs> uh, even even a lower tier Wes Carter question is 17 mega points. So you part two here really has like to I'm just lay it on here. here. Well, I, I don't want to overhype, but I mean, he's the, ow, perhaps the best question to answer, or many would say, in the history of the world. In the history, not just I mean, currently, but the history. Let me say this. Socrates, the spirit of Socrates has inhabited this room, and he's going, I don't know how to ask these kind of questions. I said it all. Okay, back to you, Z. <laughs> oh, but great, great answers. I appreciate yeah, you being on the show. Answer. And uh, now I, I hand the baton. Hand it over. Because see, we're, this is a four-man relay right here. It is. You started off because you you're explosive out of the blocks, I, it, and then you die quickly. Right, you know. Marshall. <laughs> Long stride. I haven't worked out Long this stride. year, but I was great those first two or three Long steps. Long stride. Marshall's consistent. And then he gave it to me. I took it around the turn. Now let's go to Usain Bolt. I now yeah. now we give it to Usain. <laughs> let's bring it home. I, I think I, I'm come a little bit out of left field here, a little bit, but I, I, it's interesting to me, and I think there's probably some listeners out there that may be in similar situations. Great start. So, you have a lot of people that come to you with new ideas. And one of the oh, things that I've heard a lot, um, someone comes to you with an idea that let's say they can't patent and protect. How do you <laughs> how do you get through that decision tree? Whether f run with this great idea when you know one of the big boys might come in and rip you off and smush you as a little startup you are, or keep the dream alive and just go out and compete them. So. Great question. Uh, I, I think that's still a 17, 18 point question. There probably. it is. Uh, Absolutely. So, <laughs> <laughs> uh, um, so when, when a startup comes to us, a lot of times that is one of the big things they're worried about is it is my stuff. Can I get a trademark? Can I get a patent? All of these things. Uh, when a startup comes to us, they're so early on that we try to make sure they don't worry about that stuff. Um, obviously, we, we tell them to go try to talk to a lawyer like Wes, um, but when they're at that stage and they're just starting out, the last thing I want them worried about is what's trademarkable, what's patentable, um, you know, what intellectual property they have. Sure, for some startups, that's a consideration right out the gate, but when you're an early stage startup, especially the ones that we're working with, they haven't even made a sale yet. Like yeah, the, yeah. the idea that they have might not even ever become anything at all, and so usually what they're doing is they're using that question as an excuse to not do anything. The, the same way that someone with an idea will say, um, well, we hear this a lot, like, well, I need to get my ducks in a row first before I move forward. It's like, what does that even mean? Like, what <laughs> ducks do you need to get in a row? Like, build a website, do what Tim, do what Tim Ferriss did, uh, throw some Google ads at a landing page, pretend to charge people for the product, and see if anyone is interested in doing it. Once you do that, then you can worry about hiring a uh, lawyer is, or having someone look is, at trademarks and patents. This is it. how I picture this. It's like it's like. Uh, <laughs> well, uh, I tell you what, there. Uh, you you gonna, you gonna start? You gonna start? You gonna start planting that corn there? I tell you what. No, I'm just trying to get my ducks in a row. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm telling you what. You, you can't get corn until you plant it. So you might want to think I'm, about planting I'll, that. I'll tell you corn. this here, uh, Uncle Z. What you do is you want to tape the ducks no. together because they keep them on line. Because a lot of times I were, they were in a row, but then that little duck over there. Little varmint, he started moving on over there, and I tried to tie him up, but they wouldn't stay in the line. They'd get <laughs> out of line. That, gotta... that statement <laughs> makes no sense. When in the world would you ever want to get your ducks in a row? <laughs> what are you bowling for ducks? <laughs> are you bowling for <laughs> bow it's just a bowling for ducks is the thing. <laughs> okay, so okay, so Wes, you obviously have one upped. You've one up Jake in every conceivable way. So I'm going to see, I'm going I'm to give Wes the, the, the floor here. Wes, if someone is looking for an attorney, let's say that they are kind of post startup and they yeah. need to get some of these legal aspects together. How can they get a hold of you? Well, you can check out our website, www.wintersking.com, W-I-N-T-E-R-S-K-I-N-G.com. Or you can call us, 918-494-6868, 918-494-6868. See, Wes makes a shamockery of the show. 
He comes on the show and he's he dominates. Playing. Yeah, it's like Michael Jordan seeing some third graders playing basketball. He's in his prime. He's like, You guys want to pass me the ball, guys? You guys want me to. Oh, I dunked on your face. <laughs> you guys, can I play in your pickup game? Unbelievable. Yeah, West Card always comes in, steals the thunder. <clears throat> uh, Jake, for anybody out there who wants to get a hold of you, maybe there's somebody who's that, that you know, startup, they have an idea. They got the napkin sketch, their, their pre revenue, their pre Maybe they just want a Pop Tart in the morning. Maybe they just want a Pop Tart. Maybe yeah, they just want to come by and pick up a Pop Tart in the morning. Yeah. How do they get a hold of you? What's the process? Yeah, the best way to do it is to go to launchpeer.com. That's L-A-U-N-C-H-P-E-E-R.com. And you can actually chat with our team right there on the website. So we have a nice little chat widget tool where you can chat with me or somebody on our sales team. And we'll tell you if your idea sucks or if it's great and how we can help you if it's if it's all right. See, well, can, I, can I can okay, I can I do uh, okay. can I can I chat with someone like late at night? Is, would that be okay? Would that be kind of creepy? Yeah. Well, I mean, can I do like you know which, two in the morning? Get on there and go, hey. Yeah. What are you doing? Z, did you ever see... Depends on what kind of mood our sales team's in and how much they've had to drink. So we'll see. <laughs> okay. did you ever, hey, did you ever see, uh, Jake, the uh, uh, Ernest Goes to Camp? Uh, yes, a you long remember, time ago. There's a scene where he's trying to keep people from taking the camp from him. So he developed what I, what I would call the launch pier. Where he shoots the the urinals, the, uh, the catapult. Have you seen that? You remember that scene? He's shooting... <laughs> yeah. yeah, I mean, have you ever thought about getting the, the register of the domain launch pier? So we own launch beer, launch brews, basically launch anything that doesn't cost a whole lot of money. We probably already own it. So uh, our team loves to go try to find new launch names. It's, it's a nice little thing that we have around the office. It's a little running joke. Very, uh, very nice. If you're not out there, if you're out there right now and you're looking for an immature movie to watch, watch Ernest Goes to Camp two or three times. <laughs> it's so good. All right, Jake. Have, I a, few drink, have a few drinks first. <laughs> yeah, first. Absolutely. I bet they don't have launch launch boom. That would be a good one to pick up on the side <laughs> sidebar. Oh wow, there you go. A little, little freebie I'm there. Looking, I'm looking it up right now. I know you are. Yeah. You're gonna beat me to it. <laughs> Seriously, click, click, click. if if you're out there and you're looking for a movie that doesn't have a plot, go see Ernest Goes to Camp. If you have three or four beers, maybe you can find a plot and point it out to the writers of the movie. Jake, thank you so much for being on today's show. We like to end every show with a boom. Of course. If that's okay with Wes. We want to launch a I'm boom. Ready. I'm ready for a boom. Uh, Z, launch you boom. Okay? You okay, Z? You ready? I'm, I'm, I am so ready. Marshall, I'm, are you ready for a boom? Absolutely. Jake, I'm are you ready. ready for a boom from South Carolina? Let's do it. Here All we right. go. Three, Three two, two, one, one boom. boom. If you are like most humans that I know, when you see two gas stations and one sells gas for a little bit less and they're next to each other, you might go for the one that sells gas for less money. It, it makes sense. You know, every little bit can help. You know, I don't really agree with that. I like to spend as much money as I possibly can on fossil fuels. It's just something I'm into. You know? just... But here's what's weird, though. Sometimes we save a few pennies here and there and ignore opportunities to save huge money. I'm talking about life-changing money. If you switch today, as an example, to MediShare for your health care, it could be a massive savings for you and your family. The typical savings for a family is about $500 a month. I repeat, $500 a month. Uh, so, okay, I, I have a quick question. So when you said you could save like $500 a month, I mean, are you talking about actually being able to save $500 a month? Yes, that's why I said the number. You could actually save $500 a month. Just think about that for a second. What would you do with all that extra money? Thrivers, you could be buying a flat screen every single month. That's 12 flat screens a year. $6,000 per year or 12 flat screens per Per year. Well, I have been trying to save up for 12 flat screens, and this seems to be the most uh, reasonable, prudent way to do it. And yes, people love it. They love it because it works. It's believers who share each other's health care costs. And now with over 400,000 people, a.k.a. members of MediShare, again, with over 400,000 members, there's proof it works. And it's growing like crazy. It would be like having a 7 foot tall third grader in your family. It's like growing like a weed. It is taking off. Find out how much you can save and why MediShare is so popular. Go to MediShare.com forward slash Clay. That's MediShare, M-E-D-I, share.com forward slash Clay. Or call them at 844-25-SHARE for more info. That's 844-25-SHARE. 